In this week's episode, I'm joined by Jason Benitez, Vice President of DEI at the Capital Region Chamber of Commerce. This week, our conversation is about sensory inclusive cities, Walmart's new manager pay, the Emmys, and more. Hey there, my name is Bernadette Smith. Welcome to Five Things in 15 Minutes, my weekly show where I bring good vibes to DEI. That is good vibes to diversity, equity, and inclusion with a little dash of corporate social responsibility. What I've found is that there are lots of news stories about what's going wrong in the world and lots of negative data, but there are also a lot of things going right. That's what I like to focus on. I search for DEI stories that we can be inspired by and learn from. My hope is to inspire you to experiment with some of these inclusive actions and policies within your own organization to help you build a more inclusive world. Jason, let's get started. First of all, did I pronounce your name properly? You did, and thank you so much for asking. Benitez, it's not Benitz, and uh, heard many other iterations. And just to clarify, we're in the capital region of New York, so we're in Albany, New York. Um, I know some folks here, capital region chamber, and think we're uh, in D.C., but we are in upstate Albany, New York. It was a balmy eight degrees when we woke up this morning. So (laughs) uh, it's a pleasure to be on with you, Bernadette, and thank you so much for all the good vibes you spread with this podcast and in your work and happy new year to you and the team. Thank you so much, Jason. I really appreciate that. Why don't you tell folks a little bit about your work in Albany in the Albany area? Yes. So I've been uh, with our chamber now coming up on five years this July. And really uh, for folks that may not know, chambers are membership driven organizations. So we have about 2,600 businesses, mostly in our four county radius here, Albany, Schenectady, Rensselaer and Saratoga counties, though we do have some members outside of that. We help these businesses, large and small, from, you know, single proprietor retail shops on up to bigger, uh, you know, name brand companies like GE and other companies you'll know. Uh, We help these companies. uh, Specifically, my role is to help them with their DEI journey, to meet them wherever they are in that journey, whether it's very beginning stages of forming a committee or just you know, looking to expand this work within their operations on up to, you know, bigger projects where we can connect them with some of our DEI consultants like yourself who might come in and do an entire DEI audit or, you know, that kind of thing. So really my role is the DEI components, HR, talent attraction, uh, community development, but we have a number of other team members here that can do, uh, you know, so many other resources to basically we're in the business of helping our businesses stay in business and helping our, our region be able to thrive economically. So it's such important work. And I love that there's a role specifically dedicated to helping your member organizations on their DEI journey. I mean, it just shows the, the chamber's commitment to DEI to actually have that dedicated position. Can you talk a little bit about some of the amazing things that you've accomplished? But before we went live, you mentioned, um, you know, you're looking at the data from last year, you know, five years in, it seems like you've really gotten a lot of really great things done. Yes, yes. You know, uh, I was sharing with Bernadette in the little, you know, virtual green room here that uh, this time of the year, we release a, a yearly impact report. And we've had impact really across the board. But Specifically, I'm, I'm most part of our DEI impact. And this past year, our DEI Summit, which is our annual signature DEI event of the year, this year, we broke records with our attendance and we finally broke the 300 participant mark um, with Bernadette's help. Bernadette was one of our two keynotes this year. And it's just amazing kind of reaffirmation, right, Bernadette, to, mm-hmm. uh, you know, your community is speaking to you by showing up, by being engaged and that kind of puts wins in our sales as DEI practitioners to keep going, to keep pushing. And even with all the negative news you hear and the the steps back that some in our country want to take in regards to, you know, social justice and rights, um, I think seeing that level of engagement this year has been one of the things we've I've been most proud of because it's kind of just reaffirming that that we're on the right path with this work and our region and our communities need it. So uh, thank you for helping us with that accomplishment in 23. 
You know what? Congratulations. It was a really great event. I was really impressed. Um, and I spoke with some fantastic members who were just really excited about what the potential for DEI could mean to their organization. And even personally, you know, there were some folks that I spoke with who were really talking to me about their own personal journeys towards becoming more inclusive as an individual. And so I just think that you did a really nice job of bringing people together. And uh, I appreciate the opportunity to, to speak to your, your crowd. It was a great group. It was a great day. It was a great day. Yeah, yes. that's fantastic. Well, let's get into this week's yes, good please. vibes, Jason. All right. So in this week's uh, newsletter, I actually wrote about my own sort of personal internal conflict. Here in the Chicago area where I live, there are many Venezuelan migrants who have been bussed up from Texas. Around the area, there have been um, some neighbors that have kind of formed their own grassroots community website with volunteer opportunities, donation needs. And they've even set up a program called Compañeros, where local folks can uh, basically adopt an individual or family and help them get settled locally in the Chicago area. So I was kind of aware of all of this and I wasn't really doing anything about it. I gave some money, I've given, made some donations, but I really wasn't showing up um, in any other way. And I just made kind of excuses. So I, I wrote about this, you know, my Spanish is weak, uh, limited time, etc. Just sort of convincing myself, talking myself out of getting involved. And I share this because I think a lot of people can relate to talking themselves out of showing up for others or in whatever way that means, whether it's a volunteer opportunity or whether it's uh, in speaking up in terms uh, in, with something you hear or something at work, I think that a lot of folks just get are, are afraid of getting it wrong or just can't get uncomfortable. And mm -hmm. so I just ended up volunteering. I, I did it. I did it on Saturday. I'm going to keep doing some, some things. And I think that ultimately we just got to get started. And so I share that story just to remind us that we've just got to get started. It feels really good to give. It does. So anyway, Jason, I wanted to tell that story before we uh, got into this week's good vibes. Have there been many migrants in your area? Yes, yes. Um, you know, what I, what I wanted to share with the stories, as you shared with them, is that we're in this weird place, right, where, where two truths, you know, people, we're divided and people can have different sets of facts. And I even think the, you know, word migrants, you know, mm -hmm. it, 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 it removes the person, the humane, the yes. humanness behind it. Right. So, uh, you know, what I was reminded is at the end of the day, these are people. Um, yes. And yes, we in New York has all, have also seen, unfortunately, some of these migrants used as political pawns, you know, like similar where some of our, you know, redder states have bust, you know, the migrants into bluer states, you know, as if to say, Okay, you want to be open. You want to be, you know, progressive. Here, you take the migrants. You do something mm -hmm. with them, and that's not fair to the migrants themselves. They are people, and they often yeah. uh, have little children with them, so they're innocently caught up in all of this, you know, kind of divide that we're feeling. But yeah. um, that's phenomenal that you've done something. Uh, I want to shout out and uplift Capital District Latinos. Capital District Latinos is an organization here in our area that's kind of a Latino-facing organization, and they've been. Uh, working with some of the uh, Latin migrants that have been bused to our area, uh, meeting their needs, their immediate needs, fo you know, food, clothing, shelter, that kind of thing. But um, yes, in regards to just doing something, I often find, you know, we, we, if you're not careful, you know, what is it, the uh, paralysis by analysis, where you mm -hmm. kind of just get paralyzed or you, 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 you get so overwhelmed with the scope of the problem that you feel like, what's my little effort going to do? But yep. sometimes like you, you know, to your example, just jumping in, doing something, having an impact wherever or however you can is better than not. So I applaud yeah. that effort and encourage others to do the same wherever they can in a way that makes sense for them. Exactly. And I think that's a great way to close it out in a way that makes sense for them and uh, what that looks like could be different. And, um, you know, it's just about getting started. Just you, it, when we get overwhelmed and all the negative self-talk, I think we just got to 
do something small to get the momentum yes. going. All right. All right. So let's move into this week's good vibes. Some yes. of these are definitely a case of better late than never. So <laughs> first story comes from Walmart, which has a new annual base wage for store managers, which is now 90000 to $170,000 annually for for store managers. The first time the salary is base wage has gone up in, I think, several years, three or four years. The good thing here is that 75% of store management began as hourly employees and the bonus program is more equitable as well. So they're doing things right. Better late than never. Yes. I, I think to your point, better late than never. And, you know, I'm sure there'll be viewers on here who have different views about big retail, you know, and what that means. But, um, you know, seriously, I think it's, it's a good thing when a big, you know, one of the largest, companies in our country, frankly, you know, realizes that uh, it could be doing better and and then puts the resources behind doing just that. Um, you know, we've seen double digit inflation these last few years, whereas our, our annual bonuses have only gone up two to three percent if you've even gotten a raise. So our, mm -hmm. you know, raises are not keeping up with inflation. And it's just alarming what we expect people to live on. Even the definition of the poverty line, when you really look into it, it's it's ridiculous what they think people can live on. So uh, good on Walmart, good for them. You know, there's a lot more work to be done to, to really spread that equity pie around. But, you know, it's it's we, we don't want to be in a place where we can't at least applaud the positive steps. So that's right. Good on that's them. right. <laughs> exactly. All right. Well, the second story comes from Philadelphia, which became the first sensory inclusive city in the U.S. with a certification from Culture City. About 17% of the population of Philadelphia faces disabilities, including sensory-based disabilities. So the city has now uh, trained about 70% of their 16,000 city workers. They've had sensory-inclusive training. There are now mobile stations with sensory tools and sensory bags at events. Um, and the professional sports teams are also certified as sensory-inclusive. So many ways to be inclusive, Jason. <laughs> Yes, you know, again, one of those uh, heartwarming scenarios where you want to applaud, you know, the city of Philly for the effort. But in reading the article that you share with me, I, I also see that there's a little bit of balanced reaction from some others where, mm -hmm. you know, on the one hand, they're very happy that we're raising efforts collectively about um, how the external environment can affect certain people with certain um, conditions. But then some of the folks felt like there were other disabilities that were a little bit more pressing that weren't getting effort. Mm -hmm. So, again, it's you want to applaud the efforts. Uh, it, the help is going to communities that need it. But it's also, you know, at the same time, two things can be true. Right. Yes. There's still so many communities that need the assistance. So but I just think, again, what I also love this part of the story that it wasn't just them putting up like a sensory room in their sports arenas or, you know, in, in public areas, but that it came with training. And I think that yes. that's uh, one key positive thing that I loved about the article is that 70% of the city workers got this training on how to, you know, understand those with sensory needs better and that kind of thing. So, you know, if, if physical spaces and, and physical changes can always be accompanied with training, I think yes. that's, all the better. So that I do applaud and I appreciate yeah. their efforts. We got to have that alignment. All right. The third story this week comes from the New England Patriots, which made history by hiring Gerard Mayo as their first black head coach. So Mayo is the youngest head coach in the NFL and the fourth black coach in the league should not be the case, but it is. What I like about this story, though, is uh, how Patriots owner Robert Kraft was talking about not seeing race, not seeing color, emphasizing merit, fine in theory, but that's not exactly <laughs> the ideal approach. What I love is that Mayo himself brought up race saying, I do see color because I believe if you don't see color, you can't see racism. So really about celebrating that comment and reminding folks how important it is to be mindful of everyone's lived experiences. Yes, you know, I watched the press conference one more time and I like that he said it almost like immediately after, you know, so Robert Kraft's on on mic, you know, talking about the coach and saying that we didn't pick him for his color. We picked him because he can do the job. And then 
immediately after that, they go to the coach and he immediate. So it was almost like he was clapping back at the coach, right? Yeah. To say, well, I do see color. So, you know, I, 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 again, I'm in this place of meeting people where they are in this work. And I, on the one hand, can maybe on a small level understand where Kraft was coming from in saying that statement. Like he was trying to say, you know, we think he's the best person for the job. So we just mm -hmm. applaud that. And that, I guess, is a noble kind of statement. But you also kind of have to be aware of your language and, you know, how it lands and saying this I don't see color part can be off-putting to people who feel like they experience challenge in their lives specifically due to their race or color. That's right. Because it means I don't see the unique challenges that you suffer, you know, struggle with. Um, mm -hmm. So I think it's just, again, the importance of making sure our words align with our actions and how, you know, both the actions and the words matter and are important. But uh, good on Mayo on kind of putting it back out there and saying as a black man, he doesn't have that option of not seeing color and that's right. that uh, without seeing color, you can't see racism. So I think that that's important when you have a platform and you have such an enhanced status and everybody's looking up to you as a leader to kind of make sure you're utilizing that platform to keep matters that are important to our society in, in the uh, conversation. So, so good on coach Mayo. Exactly. I agree. All right. The fourth story comes from the 2024 Emmy Awards, which awarded a record-breaking number of people of color across all categories. So a good shift from the hashtag Emmy So White trend of a couple of years ago. Um, so I want to give shout outs to Kinta Brunson, who was a second Black woman to win Best Comedy Actress. Ayo Edebiri for Black Woman for Best Supporting Comedy Actress and Lee Sung Jin, who won the was the first Asian to win Outstanding Limited Series, directing and writing in the same year. So some big wins for women of color at the Emmys. Yes. You know, again, um, similar to it, it's it's a mix of emotions. I, I'd love to get to a point in our society where we can wake up and and, you know, the day after. And, and a bunch of people of color won awards at a show and it's not news, you know, like it's not, right. it's not a thing. Uh, you know, there are so many firsts that are still happening. You know, the first woman, the first African-American, the first, and we're in 2024 and I'm amazed at how many firsts still happen, but yeah. um, you know, congratulations to those that won, you know, they certainly deserve it. And I just think it's, it's, again, it's this continued, you know, the, the more we raise awareness, the more people lean in and the more, you know, so the, the ones that judge these categories now might have had the last few years, wake them up to something and That's wake right. them up to the fact that representation matters. And I just hope that those that are on the, you know, uh, more cynical end of this, don't look at last weekend as a, as an overreaction, as over like, you know, the Emmys trying mm -hmm. to over course correct and give all the awards now to those that are marginalized. Um, you would think that that's not the case. But again, um, representation matters, visibility matters, acknowledging people from all walks of life and their accomplishments matter because that hasn't always been the case. And there have been so many groups that have been, you know, uh, strategically left out of success and telling stories. So good on the Emmys. And I just think we need to continue to push, push, push marginalized folks into all of these spaces that they haven't been in before. And hopefully we'll continue to see results like this. I know, Jason, I celebrate a lot of firsts, um, an astounding number of firsts, but I want to make sure that I celebrate them because it reminds folks that we are have still so much work to do, yes. right? Yes. Okay, let's go into the last story yep. today, which is from 321 Coffee in the Raleigh area, which is multiple cafes, has a roastery and a wholesale business, and it employs 60 adults with intellectual and developmental disabilities and hundreds more on the wait list for jobs. Now, the 80% uh, of adults have intellectual and developmental disabilities, and this coffee roastery is showing how we can create a win-win with inclusion. They're doing really well. They're expanding. And low turnover, I mean, it's just a great model. Yeah, I mean, it's phenomenal. I, I read that story and was so just impressed. And uh, we had a similar uh, retail eatery here called Puzzles Cafe that similarly hired people on the autism spectrum. And, um, you know, I think it's just a reminder for those 
uh, out in the business sector that really looking at people for what they have and what they can bring to the table. You know, I, I think a lot of this requires a mindset shift. And I feel like these last few years since the death of Judge Floyd and some of the continued social unrest, it what's what's promising is that I'm beginning to see that shift right mm -hmm. in, in our society in some areas where in this war for talent, everybody's strapped for talent. We, we, we can't afford to not be saying no to citizens. So yeah. uh, rather than look at people for what, you know, what you think they don't have, here's an example of a company that looks at people for what they have. And if there are a few barriers to employment or job satisfaction, this company isn't just throwing the hands up and saying, oh, those barriers are there. They're actively working to remove as many of those barriers as possible. So it's a model that works. It's been proven mm -hmm. by 321 Cafe and a number of others. And I think it's just an example of where if you're willing to really look at the needs of a community and work with them, no feat is too challenging to overcome. And you can really, you know, so here you have people with really good talents and they may have, you know, some areas in a work day that they have might experience more challenge than others but they can still contribute meaningfully and in a way that helps themselves and the business. So yep. good, great for that company. And I'd love to see more other companies continue to uh, take example. Exactly. I agree. Well, that's the, uh, that's the idea behind this show. So hopefully folks are taking notes, coming up with some good ideas from today's episode. Jason, yes. you have been a wonderful guest. It is always a pleasure to chat with you. I really enjoy our conversations. How can folks connect with you, Jason? Yes. Um, thank you so much for the honor of being on today, Bernadette. And I'm on LinkedIn, Jason Benitez, B-E-N-I-T-E-Z. That is the only, uh, I have one other more social media that I, you know, use, but those are the, that's the only professional platform I'm on is LinkedIn. Or if you go to capitalregionchamber.com, um, capitalregionchamber.com. Again, we're in Albany, New York. Uh, we're in upstate. We have about 2,600 member businesses. All of our contact info is right there. And I've, you know, spoken to people. I've done, you know, workshops. I've helped out folks from across the country. So with the virtual nature of things now, it should make it easier for people to reach out. But I'm on LinkedIn or CapitalRegionChamber.com. And again, I really appreciate the invite today, Bernadette, and appreciate Absolutely. all the work you're doing. Yeah, thank you so much. Folks, this week's call to action is for Girl Scout cookies. Uh, do you crave Girl Scout cookies but struggle to find them where you live, or do you just want to support trans girls? Putting a link in the show notes and in the chat about Girl Scouts who happen to be trans girls and will ship those cookies wherever you are. So get some Girl Scout cookies today, folks. All right. If you don't already get the Five Things newsletter, you can subscribe at fivethingsdei.com. Thanks so much. Have a great week. Thanks, Jason. Thank you, Brenda. Take care. Thank you for listening to Five Things in 15 Minutes. I hope you found yourself inspired by at least one of this week's stories. If you did, would you mind sharing it with a colleague and leaving us a review on your favorite podcasting platform? And if you don't already get my Five Things newsletter, join at fivethingsdei.com. I'm Bernadette Smith, and I'll see you next week right here for Five Things in 15 Minutes, bringing good vibes to DEI 